you for having us here. My name is Dominic Schmidt. I'm a uh, professor and uh, head of the Bioelectronics Laboratory at ITU, also CEO of Ardency Bionics, which is a company that uh, is commercializing this research. Um, long background in semiconductors, um, many years at Intel, last as CTO of the manufacturing group, um, multiple startups uh, acquired by Broadcom, uh, Agilent, Intel, um, both in MEMS and also in traditional advanced uh, CMOS. So many, many years of uh, hardware or silicon experience. Uh, what I wanted to talk to you about today um, is diabetes and what, how important this is and what can be done to um, solve the, some of the issues around it. Very big numbers. Um, it costs something like, actually this, this is an old study in 2010, but the numbers are like $350 billion in the U.S. alone now in 20, 2018. So that's about 2% of the U.S. economy lost every year um, due to deaths, maybe 50 million deaths worldwide, um, to lost time, um, amputations, um, horrible disease. Um, 500 million people affected, right? That's, that's more than the number of um, iPhones by like two and a half X each year. So the target market is gigantic. Um, and maybe something like 25 to $30 billion of um, equipment sold every year, uh, both in terms of the devices and also in terms of the um, reusable or actually uh, uh, the uh, strips that people use to get tested. So very large market, huge number of people, um, and as VCs, you've probably seen many presentations on this because this is kind of like the holy grail of uh, biomedical devices. It's a huge existing market, um, growing, unfortunately, every year. Uh, China is the biggest recipient of this. China, unfortunately, has picked up some of the bad habits uh, in terms of the, the developed world. Um, uh, and, and as a result, uh, diabetes is growing there uh, the fastest, I think. So huge market in China, huge market in the U.S., and um, a lot of lost productivity that could be uh, improved if we made uh, glucose monitoring um, pervasive, cheap, pervasive, easy, and painless. So today, all devices on the market, virtually all the devices on the market today, require blood, okay? Um, and they require some disposable needles, strips, chemicals, um, which are actually fairly expensive. So the device itself is not that expensive, between $50 and $100, but you need these chemicals which can run between $500 and $1,000 per year. Unaffordable in many of the world's economies and painful. Um, I have done many, many tests. We have done many, many tests um, uh, on, on these devices. You do have to prick your finger. Um, there are small needles now, smaller needles. You still need to um, penetrate the skin. It's painful. Um, potentially, you could get infections. Certainly doing it continuously is, is not practical. So now there are devices that you can implant, very expensive um, and completely invasive. So these are some of the problems that we're trying to solve. And many people have looked at this. Um, what does it take? Well, first of all, you, you need something that's completely non-invasive, we feel. We feel that if you could make it, for instance, optically, which is the method we're trying to uh, perfect, you basically bring it into the contact with the skin as a watch, uh, device like that. Um, that would eliminate a lot of the problems that people have with these devices. You want to make it small, okay, um, a watch, okay, so, so that it's very accurate, but still small enough that uh, it's non, non Invasive, not, it's not uh, something that you have to lug around. Obviously, low power, low cost. Um, we're aiming for something in the $100, $150 range. Um, but precise, as precise as equipment that costs $100,000 today. So the, the, the precision and the innovation is, is huge, required to kind of get this low power, low cost device with no consumable chemicals, all the silicon integrated and uh, leveraging the smartphone to provide the analytics, uh, the interfaces, the communication, uh, and the databases. And I'll let my associate, uh, John Ladaski, 
continue on the research side. Okay. So, hi, everybody. Uh, this is a bit of an unusual presentation. Uh, we're sharing the presentation responsibilities today. Um, Dominic and I have crossed paths many times in our lives. We were undergraduates at Berkeley together, and uh, then we didn't tell any of our fellow Berkeley graduates that we both went to graduate school across the bay at a competitive school uh, with a football team that hates the football team on the other side of the bay. Uh, he pursued his... Uh, his PhD in electrical engineering the same time that I was at Stanford Medical School obtaining my PhD in immunology. So I've been brought onto the team uh, in order to provide some of the biomedical support. I have less engineering experience than Dominic, obviously, but um, I do have a fair amount of biomedical experience. So I've been asked to present the technical side here. Um, so we are talking about a device that doesn't irritate the human body, doesn't do any damage to the human body, doesn't draw any blood, and Dr. Schmidt said we will use optical methods to get this done. So what optical methods are we talking about? There are two established methods for measuring glucose that have already been shown in laboratory tests, and this was demonstrated quite a number of years ago, but so far nobody has been able to produce a product that actually performs this measurement. It's not a theoretical problem. It's not a machine learning problem. It's not a problem of uh, chasing, chasing some sort of signal that, that you're not sure about. We know that we want to detect the chemical glucose, and there are at least two different optical signatures that we can use. So on the left side, you see something called thermal emission spectrometry, and this makes use of the fact that the human body itself is a light source at about 10 micrometers wavelength in the infrared. And if you look at those particular wavelengths, um, on the left side is, uh, is a a comparison of, of uh, a sample of water, the dark blue line, and increasing amounts of blood sugar. And you can see that there are certain wavelengths of light that are increasingly absorbed with the infrared light. One minute. Oh, wow. You took that much time? Okay. <laughs> On the other side, here's another technique, Raman spectroscopy. Um, and this, this technique doesn't use a, um, an intrinsic light source. It requires a laser, but you can see that you can get very sharp peaks at specific wavelengths of light in Raman spectroscopy. So we've started bending metal and making hardware. The first uh, thermal emission prototype is on the left-hand side, and um, Judy Ye, one of our other researchers, uh, built this device a few years ago, and she was able to show that she was able to get uh, a measurement that rose and fall concurrently with a blood sugar test. Uh, the new device that we have on the right-hand side uh, uses a, a different and more portable technique which, uh, which measures the same wavelengths of infrared light, and we've built it into a few different formats. We have, um, we have a, the printed circuit board on the top left either goes into an earpiece device, and we could talk about the technical reasons for why it might be good to take that measurement in the air, we also have a tabletop device. Finally, the final technology would be a wrist-worn device. Hi, I'm John DeRico. Happen to have some semiconductor background as well. Uh, what is your ultimate product? Is it a cell phone, Fitbit? There's a number of different sensors. There's electrochemical, you know, breath sensors. There's other optical sensors, and so on. And and if that's the market and the the ultimate price that Apple or someone will pay is a buck and a half. How does your strategy play into that? So yes, the ultimate product is basically a watch, uh, potentially with uh, an earpiece that uh, could be wireless uh, connected to the watch. Um, it would work in conjunction with a smartphone. So like the iWatch, the communication aspects, uh, the display interface uh, would be through a uh, through a, through a phone. Um, there is we also make a uh, portable version which has its own display more for travelers and maybe for hospital use. But you know, it's a device that connects to a smartphone and the idea is you know, to make it as, as inexpensive as possible and potentially you know, have a model that, um, you know, there's a subscription model um, where people maybe don't pay m at all for the device itself and then pay for a service, monitoring service, where you know, they, uh, th there's a signature stored with the biomarkers that John described. So, so you think there is an ongoing, call it standalone product with an interface versus having a, call it a chip-based product that 
gets licensed or bought by one of these guys because I know a lot of other companies are moving that direction and that would be a competitive um, threat yeah, to you address. Know, we're open to that. We have a partner in China that uh, is looking actually at licensing the technology for devices, for their own devices. So we would be open to that. Um, yeah, I think some previous speakers said that each market is different and you don't necessarily want to conquer each market yourself. Um, so you do need to make a prototype device and you do want to be in the market with that device to some extent to prove it out, to show that the miniaturization works, that it's sensitive enough. How that then gets propagated in the market, uh, you know, fairly open at this stage. We would consider licensing for incorporating this into a phone, potentially, for instance, or somebody else's devices, absolutely. Quickly, I, I, I suspect you guys have more to show us. Is there uh, a well, slide a for for product? Slides. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, this okay. this one here, you know, basically it's the next generation device. This is one. This is the one for the Raman, and this is a MEMS chip that we design at Stanford. We built at Stanford. We design uh, ourselves uh, that does the Raman on a chip. Oh, so okay. it's a very inexpensive kind of hundred dollar Raman system. As you know, Raman systems today we've we've done many measurements with them. Compare the left and the right. Yeah, they're if kind of. If you want to take a Raman spectroscopy measurement right now, you can put your arm underneath that big black column on the left. Which we have. There, which we have. Which we have actually done, but that's not obviously the device that we want to build. The goal is to miniaturize Raman spectroscopy, and that chip is 15 millimeters on the short axis and 25 on the long. So the goal is to build something that's fully integrated and costs, you know, the, the chip itself is like $10, right? I mean, that's the only way to make this feasible. Um, the bring the cost of the entire system with the two sensors and actually many other sensors uh, for about a hundred dollars. Okay, thanks. Uh, for your uh, thermal emission, uh, are you using a single uh, infrared detector or, or something else? And then in each case, what's the uh, accuracy compared with the standard measurement? So the minimum number of wavelengths that you need to measure in order to take a blood sugar measurement with infrared light is two. You need one wavelength that is sensitive to blood sugar, let's say right here, this notch, and you need another one that's insensitive to blood sugar, let's say right here. Okay, so that's the, the minimum configuration. And in fact, we're, we're trying to improve the accuracy of the system, um, it depends on a, a few parameters, one of which is the temperature of the human body going up and down is actually a variable that we need to eliminate. So if you look here on the, on the right, there are actually four windows here and we're hoping to use some extra wavelengths in order to improve the accuracy of the system. Um, could, could you guys tell us a little bit about your company, where, you, where you're based, where, um, you know, how many people you have? All right. um, um, so um, th so the company is small, we also incorporated recently as we've just started very limited uh, medical trials, clinical trials uh, under an IRB at ITU. So you know, we're, we're, we wanted to get this to the point where at least the basics uh, were, were done, but the company is incorporated. It is incorporated in Los Altos Hills, uh, so local here. Um, yeah, most of the people are um, also here locally, uh, all with a semiconductor background. Uh, John actually is really the, the, the main person on the bio side. Everybody else is uh, either software, um, PCB design, um, industrial design of the, of the enclosure, and, and CMOS design. That's the main one. And, and, and you guys will, will be launching uh, uh, your product here in the U.S.? It's a good question. Um, actually, right, right now our partner, as I mentioned, is in China. Um, and we do have a slide on sort of financials. Yeah. Um, we are looking for some investment to complete the, the production prototype. Uh, we have a device that is not completely scaled to the footprint we want, but um, it, it, it has something like eight different sensors, including the two sensors we mentioned. There's also other sensors like sweat and, and, and more standard sensors. So we are looking for uh, some additional funding. We've so far funded this ourselves. Uh, we've, we've funded about one and a half million dollars so far. Um, we are looking for some additional outside funding. And then we have a partner who will basically conduct the medical trials in China. And, and right now, that's our first target market. Uh, they have an even greater need than, than in the US because um, you know, it's even less affordable there. And, and there's not too many other options. So uh, they are very keen on bringing that to the market there. OK, thank you.
A any regulatory hurdles, concerns, or anything? Yeah, it's a gr great question. All, all these medical devices, um, so, you know, have that issue. Um, to try to uh, get around that to some extent, we are initially marketing this as a wellness device. Um, you know, the number of people that need glucose sensing medically is actually not as high as the people that need glucose sensing in general. Um, you know, you may not have a serious medical issue yet, but monitoring your blood sugar, um, you know, is something that actually like 500, maybe more, million people need. So the idea is to provide one device that does that gives you a very accurate sensing, but not necessarily medically, medical grade. Um, and the difference there may be only a few percent, um, but the regulatory difference is huge. And so you can sell a wellness device, you know, essentially tomorrow, uh, whereas a medical grade device uh, requires, you know, significant clinical trials. And we will do those, but we want to get to the market as quickly as possible. Once um, the device is fully miniaturized and the cost is at the point that we want, we want to take it to the market as a wellness device, not as a medical device immediately. Thank you so much.